Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's already been one day and great fun, and I hope we can continue uh, tomorrow. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been involved in applying machine learning to criminal justice systems for 20 years, and I have the scars to show for it. Um, I think I'm doing a pretty good job uh, because it seems that everybody hates me. Uh, <laughs> and one, of my most, one of my recent emails, which was a gentle one, compared me to Darth Vader. <laughs> and uh, now, I, now I need my pictures. Let me just use this couple of seconds then just to mention that this work I'm going to talk about um, is done um, with Michael Kearns and with Aaron Roth and uh, Carrie Colonis, who's a law professor at Penn. We have a group that's been working on this matter of fairness and other issues that come up when you apply algorithmic methods or what Carrie likes to call decisions by robot to real situations, to real decisions where there are real consequences. Uh, and so that there are a lot of issues that have already, well, there are a lot of issues that have already come up today. I'm only going to touch on a few of them, assuming my slides uh, come back. OK, I, I've already given you a sort of introductory pitch. Um, again, this is a joint project. Um, the work is very much in progress. We have technical sides of this. And we have um, normative sides of this. Because this is in criminal justice in particular, there's no way to avoid the normative issues. The moment you get into a criminal justice setting, you're dealing with law and administrative practice, which is co codified norms. So there's no way to avoid some of the problems you're talking about. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. First question that's come up already today compared to what? Um, in the criminal justice setting, our goal is to do better than human decision makers. <laughs> Turns out that's a very low bar. And that's a good thing because um, our procedures are relatively new. Uh, they have lots of problems, uh, but we've already benchmarked them against judges and magistrates and parole boards and parole officers. And we are at least more accurate. And I'll get to the measure, measure of fairness in a little bit. It's important also that we start out appreciating what the job of the criminal justice system is first. In my discussions, when people call me Darth Vader or worse, they're usually concerned that somehow I'm not being fair, or at least I'm not being as fair as magistrates and judges and so on. But they forget that there are crime victims. From the Philadelphia Inquirer, three teens believe targeted older men, man all shot outside a Southwest Philly bar. Victim stab at Old City Bar dies. Homicide tally rises. Homeless man death rule a homicide. Woman pulled from a car raped. Man arrested. Bearded man sought in six armed Philly store robberies, police, man called Gotti arrested for two rapes, and so on. When I do work with criminal justice agencies, when I testify in various legislative bodies, this is where they always start. The job is public safety. While these other things we're talking about, accuracy and fairness, are obviously very important, we can't lose sight of this. And often in the discussions, we do. These are not built into the loss function, typically. And that's a problem that I'll, I'll get back to. So we're worried about future dangerousness. That is the main mission, at least initially, of these criminal justice agencies. So we have these kinds of folks, and we have these kinds of folks. And we need to distinguish between them, because the gentleman on the left will presumably be treated differently than the gentleman on the right. We can intervene in various places when an individual is arraigned after an arrest. There's a decision whether to hold somebody over till the next court appearance or release them. There are sentencing decisions, parole, sorry, probation, sentence, how long the sentence, prison safety, when someone goes to prison, how do you protect the safety of the inmate, not only with other inmates, but with staff. Parole, once someone's released, there's a kind, various kinds of supervision that can be employed, and that goes to the matter of supervision. So there's lots of places to intervene. All of these involve decisions by criminal justice decision makers, and these are all points where, in principle, future dangerousness is important. And in many of these, for example, sentencing, it's required by law. The problem is uh, a classification one that you're all very familiar with. This is just a two-dimensional classification system. I've got the good guys and the bad guys in two different regions. My bad guys happen to be in a region of high number of priors and a large number of charges for the instant offense. Of course, this is a very simple illustration. Very commonly, we have hundreds of dimensions. And the goal, of course, is to put some kind of classification boundary or decision boundary between them. And our experience is almost always nonlinear. Um, but it's doable, and we can make some progress. And you all know about this. This is a standard classification problem 
that so far at least we haven't used tools like deep learning on. This works pretty good, and I can do it on my desktop in about 20 minutes. Now, when we do this classification, uh, now the normative stuff starts, starts really having some bite. We can make two kinds of mistakes. We can release uh, the high-risk individual, we'll put them back on the street when we really shouldn't, and we can incarcerate the choir boy when that choir boy presents no problems. Now, the standard way this has been done historically, like Compass, for example, who was discussed earlier, is that these two kinds of mistakes are treated the same. They're equally costly. And of course, that's nonsense. And if you talk to criminal justice stakeholders, they will tell you it's nonsense. The good news is that very commonly, with a little bit of discussion, you can at least rank order which mistake is worse and very commonly put a cost ratio on it. So commonly, even when you talk to people in the communities in which these crimes occur, they're more likely to say it's a worse mistake to release a high-risk individual than to detain an individual that's not high risk. That might trouble some of you. It's not your call. It's the call of the stakeholders who are involved, both the criminal justice individuals, the defense attorneys, the prosecutors, and of course the people who will be victimized when the high risk folks go out, and the families that will be disrupted when the choir boys are inappropriately detained. What that means is you cast a different kind of net than you might think. Well, actually you probably do think properly about this. Um, you cast a very wide net looking for the high-risk folks, and you catch most of them. The price, of course, you pay is you catch in that net lots of individuals who really shouldn't have been classified as high-risk. And that trade-off between false positives and false negatives is really what I was referring to with that seesaw. And there's no way out of it. If you ignore the problem, you're treating the costs as equal. And as I said, no criminal justice actor, decision maker will ever tell you they're equal. You can't make this go away. You have to deal with it. Most algorithms don't. Trade-offs, that's going to be a theme now for the rest of the talk. You're going to have to address these. When I testify before city councils, I bring this to their attention. They won't touch it, um, but I'll get back to that. This is just an illustration of what I mean by trade-offs. This is a fake confusion table. On the left margin is individuals who are actually arrested or not arrested, although I should stress that in practice when I do this stuff, I have three, four, five outcome categories. There's a big difference between an arrest for burglary and an arrest for rape or homicide. And that difference has to be built in. You have to look at different categories. Most of the work is just binary, which again, if you talk to criminal justice stakeholders, they'll say it isn't what they want. Along the top are forecasts. So I can forecast an arrest or forecast not an arrest with classifier of your choice. But upper right-hand cell is false negatives. Those are individuals who are really bad guys. Uh, but my algorithm said they're not, and lower left-hand cell is false positives where the reverse is true. Now, the way these numbers came out the way I've cooked them here, uh, there's 100 to 300, so that one false negative is worth three false positives. A false negative is three times more costly. Very commonly, we find that stakeholders want a 10 to 1 ratio. But if you go down this path, that larger net I'm talking about, which is going to cast to catch a lot of the bad guys is going to catch a lot of the good guys, too. And that's a trade-off you have to make. But it's a value choice, not my choice, but the stakeholders have to make that choice. So I get to the situation now. I've decided in advance what my ratio of costs are going to be for mistakes. And I turn to my classification algorithm. And again, I'm faced with a normative problem. I have a lot of predictors I can use, hundreds maybe. And some of them are going to be declared out of bounds by the policymakers and stakeholders. So I'm not allowed to use race. I'm not allowed to use gender. Most violent crime is committed by men. Do you really not want to use gender as a predictor? And very commonly, I can't use other things like zip code because of residential segregation. If I know where somebody lives, is a good bet I know what their racial background is as well. So I can proceed. Immediately when I do this, because gender, race, and zip code do predict, I'm going to lose accuracy. When I talk to folks about this informally, what they say is, well, the political heat is too much. You can't, can't include race and zip code. And gender, I'm not sure about. We're prepared to have, let's say, seven or eight more homicides this year that we could have anticipated in trade for not using those predictors. That's a value choice that gets built into the algorithm. Now, we've had some talk today about variables that are not explicitly prohibited, but that are correlated with race. Let me just sort of lay out what this picture is saying about that. This is sort of a Venn diagram, not literally, uh, more of a metaphor. We have three variables. We have a variable arrest that we're trying to 
classify on or forecast. We have what seems to be a legitimate criminal justice variable prior record, more prior arrests, more prior convictions. That's associated with subsequent arrests. And we have race. And all three of those are related to one another. The size of the overlap indicates the size of the relationship. And in particular, prior record and race are related to arrest. Now, one option that's given to me is don't use race at all. Well, as you can see, that green area is now gone. Okay, It's not there. But that red area remains. I'm not going to forecast as well because that green area is gone. But the overlap between race and prior record remains. And that's what's got a lot of people upset, legitimately. We heard, for example, police disproportionately arrest blacks. That gets built into the prior record. So then when we use prior record, we've baked in the racism of police. And that's not right. So there are various things I can do to change that. A simple thing I can do is pre-process the data so I pull out everything that overlaps with race. So now I'm left only with the magenta overlap and I've really taken a hit on my forecasting accuracy. Now, you can explain this to people. There are statistical ways of removing, pre-process the data to remove these racial components. Some are better than others. That's, by the way, a very interesting technical discussion that's going on right now. Some are better than others, but I'm going to lose accuracy. And again, more individuals are going to be released who shouldn't be, and more individuals are going to be incarcerated who shouldn't be. I'm going to make more of those mistakes. But I'm going to be fair. You can say everybody's equally worse off. This is an example uh, of an actual analysis. It's a very simple one, which illustrates another kind of trade-off. Um, we've talked about the fact that there's different kinds of fairness. Kleinberg and his colleagues and some others have focused on two kinds of fairness, and there are five or six that we've looked at in our group. One is predictive accuracy. For the positive outcome, are you equally accurate, let's say, for blacks and whites? And that's a good thing. Likewise, there's going to be false positives and false negatives. So you're going to have a false positive rate and a false negative rate. Those should be equal across races as well. And there's an impossibility theorem which they proved, which says, except in very stylized situations, which don't incur in at least the kinds of data I've ever seen, you can't have both. So this is an illustration where I tune the data so that my positive predictive value is the same for blacks and whites, effectively the same. I'm 93% accurate. 93% of the time when I say someone's going to not be arrested, I'm right for blacks, and 94% of the time I'm right for whites. Effectively the same. I tuned it that way. If you look at the false negatives and false positive rates, though, they're dramatically different. That's what this theorem is about. I can't have them both. I could have tuned them so that my false negative rates and false positive rates were the same, but then I wouldn't have the same predictive accuracy. In this case, the way I, this is real data, in this case, what happens is that the mistakes that are made disproportionately impact blacks. They are more likely to be falsely thought to be high risk and less likely to be falsely thought low risk. So the way the false positives and false negatives work out is blacks are disproportionately classified high risk inaccurately. That's inevitable if I want the, false po the predictive accuracy to be the same. And it turns out that one of the key villains in this is different base rates. If you have different base rates for blacks and whites, let's say for arrests or for men and women for arrest, that cascades through the entire analysis and makes it impossible to have these equivalences the way you want them. You have to make these trade-offs. You can't ignore them. You can't say this is fair by just focusing on predictive accuracy. You can't say this is fair by just focusing on false negatives and false positives, which, by the way, is where ProPublica got in trouble. You have to consider it all. And it's worse because there's more kinds of fairness that I don't talk about in here. There are lots of different ways you can respond to this. Um, Michael, for example, um, is working on an algorithm that penalizes the fit for uh, violations of certain kinds of fairness. That's in processing. I happen to tune this by hand, but his algorithm, I hope, will work a lot better. And there's other ways of dealing with it. You can try to patch it up at the end by trying to make these equivalences work. The price you'll pay then will be accuracy. There's no easy trade-offs for any of this stuff. And here's something that um, Michael and I were just talking about a couple of weeks ago. This is old news to any attorneys who are here, who at least to work in criminal law. Uh, it may be new news to lots of you. When we say we want equivalence, equivalence with respect to what? I was reading an article well, a couple of weeks ago 
about sentencing patterns in the state of Florida. And while these numbers aren't exactly right, they capture the essence of it. Whites, on the average, are sentenced to about a year less in similarly situated situations, same background, same crime, and so on. Why that is, we can all speculate about, but it's a real issue. So we see this in the data, and we want to have the same sentences. Do we make blacks like whites so that everybody gets six five points of five years? Do we make whites like blacks? Everybody gets 7.8. That's equally equal, right? Or do we find something in the middle? The target for equality needs to be part of the algorithm. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you'll optimize on accuracy, perhaps with some constraint on fairness, and you're going to come up with situations that on other policy grounds are unacceptable. For example, if we decide to make whites like blacks in terms of sentence length, we are not responding constructively to the mass incarceration concerns that we have these days. On the other hand, if we make blacks like whites, we are. There's a whole new set of policy and value considerations that have to be built in. We decide exactly what we mean by equivalence. And there's going to be some target that has to be specified. It's not a problem for statisticians or computer scientists. It's a policy problem. And it must be addressed. Unless you address it, you're going to get perhaps very unsatisfactory results that perhaps are accurate and reasonably fair, but are not what the policy community asks for. So where are we in all this? We have people putting their thumbs on the scale all the time in criminal justice settings, and the algorithms do the same. When we say, for example, that there are different base rates and we want the forecasting accuracy to be the same for blacks and whites, we have to treat black crimes as less serious than white crimes. That's a thumb on the scale. There are people who are going to be pushing the scale from the other direction, just like in this picture. Our goal, this is a goal in our group at Penn, we're trying to develop algorithms so at least those trade-offs are transparent. You can imagine dials on your algorithm. How many more crimes are you going to miss for how much more fairness of this kind versus how much more fairness of that kind? When you have these dials, the hope is that sooner or later, policymakers will be able to respond intelligently to these trade-offs. Right now, they're obscure to us. I'm sure they're obscure, obscure to them, even though they're all, in fact, being acted on all the time. They're there even though nobody recognizes it. So where are we now? Conclusion, you can't have it all. Okay? It's depressing, but the good news is once we recognize this, that poor young man there, uh, a couple of years from now may be smiling um, because I think we can make excellent technical progress on all the questions that I've just raised. And we can also increasingly alert the policy stakeholder community to what these trade-offs are that they're making implicitly anyway that we hope to make more apparent so they can be properly addressed. I'm ready for questions.